violence is self-defeating. He who lives by the sword will perish by the sword. You know, when you construct a man as a great man, there's nothing almost more satisfying than also seeing him as the opposite. When the National Archive puts government documents up on the web, one has to confront them. Tapes from the hotel rooms, FBI reports, those are pieces of information that we shouldn't have. The FBI was most alarmed about King because of his success. He realized how sick this country was. We were trying to reveal the truth about segregation. J. Edgar Hoover is famous for saying that he feared the rise of a black messiah. The FBI says it's clear Martin Luther King Jr. is the most dangerous Negro in America, and we have to use every resource at our disposal to destroy him. J. Edgar Hoover was the head of the FBI for 48 years. The FBI's focus was collecting salacious sexual material of King with various girlfriends. Hoover had made the speech that Martin Luther King was the world's most notorious liar. Now, what am I going to do about Martin Luther King? It looks to me like he's too far north. This was a way that they could bring down a very influential black civil rights leader and contain the movement. The FBI mailed a tape of Dr. King with other women to him and to Coretta with an advice that he should go kill himself. The greatness of America is the right to protest far right. Staying calm under fire is very hard when people are trying to kill you. Anybody who was to the left of mainstream in civil rights was deemed a subversive. They use surveillance in order to foment violence and break apart these organizations. They were running a surveillance state. This represents the darkest part of the Bureau's history. January 2021 has seen a historic moment in the United States once again with the inauguration of the 46th US president. It also coincides with the release of a hard hitting documentary which looks into Martin Luther King and the events which led up to his assassination on April the 4th, 1968. The documentary MLK FBI was released to coincide with his 92nd birthday on January the 15th. Joining me now to discuss the documentary and many other issues that came out as a result of the documentary, I have an esteemed panel. Kenneth Alexander Campbell, who was one of the producers working on the documentary, is joining us. Also joining us is writer Barrington Salmon, entertainment reporter at Metro Alicia Adejobi, and film critic and journalist Latoya Austin. Okay, Kenneth, let's kick it off with you. Um, Talk to us about the beginning of the project in terms of the timeline. So from the kind of conception of the idea to the final product, talk to us about the timeline and how things were pieced together. So I should say that um, I originally uh, learned about this project when it was just an idea uh, that Ben Hadeen uh, was discussing, uh, we met in North Carolina where I was going to school um, and he was uh, teaching a couple of film courses. And um, he invited me to screen my first film at a festival that he was uh, doing. And at the end of that festival, he mentioned this idea about um, making a a documentary about the way that the FBI had surveilled and harassed Dr. King. And I remember when he told me that, I remember distinctly thinking that, you know, that was something that I, that was a story that I had already known and that I was surprised. I was like, isn't this already, I was thinking it was already a film. Um, but as he started telling me more and more about it, I realized that, you know, that's, um, it's not, it, it wasn't a story that had really been told in depth yet. It's something that we talk about kind of, you know, amongst um, ourselves, you know, I don't think they definitely don't teach it in school, um, 
but there's kind of just a general knowledge that, you know, the FBI was wiretapping Dr. King. And I think that's for a lot of people in the States, I think that that's kind of the, the extent of our knowledge, um, generally speaking. So when he started to really uh, tell me some of what he was finding um, with, there's a book that he was reading um, and some new documents that had come out in 2017, then I, I realized that, you know, that um, is an important story that I wanted to be a part of telling because, you know, to me, a, a great story is one that feels familiar. It feels like it, it should have already been told. Um, so I actually, at the time I offered, I was, uh, you know, getting ready to go into the uh, graduate program for film at Howard. And I, I was just, I said, you know, let me just be a PA or something just so that I can support this work and be a part of it. And um, I guess uh, Ben and Sam, they just decided that I was gonna be one of the, the producers and uh, more specifically the impact producer. Um, so 2017, 2018, things were moving kind of um, slowly. I think a lot of research was being done. Um, I did a little bit of, of research on uh, Stanley Levinson, who's kind of a critical, uh, character, if you will, uh, in this story, because he's really the uh, associate and friend of Dr. King that um, kind of jumped off J. Edgar Hoover's um, and the FBI's uh, in investigation and eventually um, uh, surveillance and harassment of Dr. King because of Stanley Levinson's associations with the the Communist Party USA. Um, so there was, you know, very kind of uh, slow but but consistent movement on the production. Um, I think that the, you know, some of the initial um, meetings were not fruitful at the time in 2018 uh, with Netflix and and some other distributors for the film. Um, but I think the timing, you know, of when, you know, this, this film really started to pick up momentum in late 2019 and early 2020, um, and for, you know, IFC to, to pick up this film and for it to, to premiere at Toronto International Film Festival, um, to be, you know, completed right during the summer of 2020, um, after the murder of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, um, and the, the subsequent um, just violation of, of the Black Lives Matter activist organizations and movement, um, that parallel with this film and the the moment that we're that we're in right now um, is perfect. It, you know, this film wasn't going to come out at a better time um, than now. So, yeah, I, I hope that was a, a good kind of you know brief. Uh, what is it called? I, I heard uh, someone call it a whistle whistle view or a whistle stop whistle. tour. Yes. There we go. Say it one more time for me. Whistle stop tour. Whistle stop tour. Okay, so hopefully that's what that was for you. Um, that's that's sure. you know where we're at now. And, and just before I bring in the rest of the panel, because uh, obviously we've all had a chance to see the documentary, and I'm sure we've all got our own questions and viewpoints. Um, what would you say to those people who look at America in 2021 and America in 1968 and not see too much of a difference? Um, well, what I would say is that, you know, that uh, America of 2021 is a result of America in 1968. Um, so there has been a lot of change and development. Uh, the, you know, the agencies uh, have multiplied and metastasized far beyond the FBI and the ability I mean, the capabilities of, of surveillance now are, uh, you know, it's, it's just far beyond what could have been imagined in 1968. Um, I think that, you know, one of the most 
uh, enduring similarities between uh, now and, and 1968 that remains important through all um, all you know, movements for justice, I think, though, is the, the need for somehow to be able to trust. Um, and I think that that's something that uh, is, you know, it's always the kind of counterpoint to the question of spies and, and surveillance and, um, you know, the kind of clandestine uh, um, organizations is it just creates a, a total uh, sense of distrust of everything. Um, but it's so essential to reestablish that. Um, I think it was, it was critical in 1968 and it's, and it's critical now to understand both in movements and in, in society, um, you know, who can be trusted and what are credible sources of information. Alicia, um, talk to us about, uh, as a Black Brit, um, the importance of understanding the story of what happened to Dr. King. Um, I think it's incredibly important. As um, Black Brits, obviously, we are exposed to so much um, of American culture and American history as well. And obviously we're taught some of it in schools and we see it in films and documentaries, but obviously being over here and growing up here, we can never fully understand um, exactly what it's like to grow up in America, whether it was 50 years ago or now. Um, so I think a film or a documentary like this is important to show because we have our own issues, I guess, within the uh, police system. In America, you have your own issues as well, and we might not be privy to just how far um, the FBI took their um, surveillance and harassment of Dr. King. So I think for me, this was, like you said, um, Kenneth, you mentioned that you didn't know um, the extent of which they went, and I I didn't really know either. So a film like this was incredibly eye-opening, eye and the film completely blew me away as well. I thought it was brilliant, so congratulations on that. Um, but in terms of an educational standpoint as well, I think it was a, the perfect education for me to, yeah, get an, ov an overview, but also a very deep understanding of exactly how they made this man into an enemy when it's quite ironic that they were accusing him of all these aggressive things when they were the aggressive ones um, in the way that they were harassing him. So. Latoya, Sorry, as a your question. <laughs> Sorry, no, no, no. It it's kind of perfectly sums up just kind of your kind of um, grasp of the issues at hand. Um, Latoya, I was just going to bring you in there as a film critic. How do you how do you um, kind of compartmentalize what you see as a film critic and in general as a as a Black British person? I think certainly in terms of compartmentalization, um, key issues will be the various themes throughout the film. So especially now where we have had a lot of um, awareness and uprisings recently in terms of race relations and harassment, um, themes such as harassment and that connection with various institutions and authorities as a black person um, will be one of the areas that are essentially dissected um, when looking at the film in terms of reviewing it. Um, it's relevance to this day as well because I think it will resonate with so many given that um, as has been alluded to uh, a lot of interactions haven't changed since 1968 and there still is that degree of disproportionate harassment towards um, figures that are quite prominent within um, black activism but also just in terms of providing um, black history and that stability as well amongst the black communities. Um, so I think certainly a lot of those key elements um, are reviewed in terms of um, looking at a film with its various facets as well. Um, so I think overall it is 
as a black British person still very pertinent to us to look at historical figures, their treatment, um, and the way that it still fits into the narrative that we have now. Barrington, you, you, you come into this with a unique perspective, um, with both the understanding of the British experience and the American experience. Um, yeah. For the uninitiated, just go into more detail about kind of your um, appreciation of both cultures and in terms of what we're discussing, the differences between America now and America back then. Okay. Um, I was born in London, in North London. I grew up in the 60s, then went to Jamaica when I was eight years old and moved to the US when I was 19. Um, went, to, went to college, junior college, been working, writing for various newspapers for the past 37 years. Um, it's interesting because a lot of times when I, like when I looked at a movie, at a documentary like, like MLK, FBI, I'm always making comparisons between what I remember and what I know of the way that the system operates in London, in England, and in the US. And it's a much softer, a much less, I don't, I wouldn't say less aggressive, but it's a much, it seems to be a much, and none of the words seem appropriate, but I'll say softer way that Brits deal with, with, um, with black, black organizations, black people. There is a, a level of aggression that, that I see in the US. And it, it, it is interesting because you look at a, an organization like the Black Panthers who were created, it was created to defend the black community from police oppression and police occupation. But J. Edgar Hoover called them the most dangerous organization in America. And he then went ahead and called Martin Luther King the most dangerous Negro leader in America. And a lot of what I saw just reminds me of the fact that America has never come to terms with its original sin, which is slavery. And they've never figured out what to do with African Americans or black people in this country. And they still haven't been able to figure out whether to allow, give African Americans, Africans in this country, the space to be full citizens. And so I look at, I look at that. I think about the interviews I've had with Black Lives Matter and other social justice activists and the FBI is doing the same thing now that it was doing then. In 2017, um, Christopher Ray, who, who is the FBI director, William Barr, who was attorney general and, um, and the occupant, they decided that to, to, to call Black Lives Matter and other black organizations, black identity extremists. And they have been, there's been extra surveillance, there's been, been monitoring, there have been all these different things that they're doing. And they basically ignored white domestic terrorists that have killed more people and caused more harm to people of color and black people than the so-called black, ex, black, black identity extremists. And so the FBI is still not to be trusted because the COINTEL, COINTEL Pro program might not be as active as it was, but they still view black people as the enemy. Kenneth, when, when you hear the feedback and kind of the insight of our panelists, what, what are you taking away? Well, you know, just, I would echo everything that Barrington just said, um, that I think, you know, when we talk about um, the way that the, this, you know, we can say the FBI, we can say the CIA, but really, you know, and when you see the film, it, you, it's understood and it's explained that um, this wasn't just J. Edgar Hoover, although he was the most uh, virulent um, and, and, you know, in the position of the, the head of the FBI, but it was, you know, it was all the way up to, um, you know, the, the Kennedys and uh, President Johnson. Um, this was the government. This was the federal government um, that 
had identified at various points, Dr. King, the Black Panthers, um, as the greatest internal threat to the country. And I think, you know, it's, it's important to note that it was right after Dr. King gave his speech about a dream that he was identified as the most dangerous Negro in the country. And it was after the Panthers had established their free breakfast program for children that they were identified as the greatest internal threat. Um, it's when, uh, because of the extraordinary oppression in this country that black Americans uh, find a way to manifest in reality what uh, this country uh, says it is in prose that black Americans become the greatest threat to the narrative. And that's when we become targets. Um, I think that that, you know, that is really uh, something that's very important to understand, not just in a theoretical sense, but in a practical sense today for, uh, you know, for the movement for black lives, um, not just in the United States, but also, you know, all throughout the diaspora is that when we really begin to address the concrete material conditions in a way that um, is viral and infectious and, and you know when you're talking about a dream and when you're actually uh, working to make that dream real by addressing people's needs, feeding people, educating people, giving people um, access to healthcare, which is what the, the Panthers were doing. And ultimately, you know, uh, helping to unite workers, which is what Dr. King was doing in his last days. Uh, I think that that, we have, to, we have to know that that's when the real, um, the real, uh, the surveillance and the harassment escalates. And so that, uh, I think, um, yeah, that's what I'm taking away, particularly from what uh, Mr. Barrington just said. I think it's, it's critical that we, we know that now because today is not 1968. And if we, you know, we can't, you know, be trying to repeat history. We're living in real time. Clearly anything can happen. Um, nobody expected for 2021 to get off to, you know, the start that it did. Um, but if we really take kind of these essential, these essential lessons and, and um, have kind of a, a greater, a deeper collective understanding, then we can make greater strides towards uh, freedom. Why hasn't America apologized for obviously these sorry episodes, not just with Martin Luther King, but if you go down the list, so many other atrocities that America has committed, particularly against black people. Why hasn't that apology been forthcoming? Well, I think, you know, that apologies, uh, particularly when they're issued by a state, um, apologies typically come before, uh, you know, some kind of retribution or some kind of, uh, um, you know, there's, there is a follow-up to an apology. And for this country, you know, that, um, you know, like, like Barrington said, again, you know, we're talking about kind of the origin story of this country. We're talking about, you know, a, a deep contradiction that, you know, w really um, has been avoided since the inception of, of this, of this nation. So I think that in order to um, issue that apology this country is really going to have to be in a place where it's prepared to confront not just um, slavery, but really every foundational issue um, of injustice, including the indigenous people, including the oppression of all of the um, various waves of immigrants that have come and experienced uh, persecution and violation of their human rights. Uh, it really you know, the, the question around uh, Black liberation in this country, um, it, every other question in this country is, is connected to it. 
So if you open that door, it's like pen. It's, it's if you open that that question, it's like Pandora's box. I, do you think the moment for that came with the inauguration of Barack Obama, or was that is that asking too much in terms of that liberation? Wow. Uh, That's a big question. Can if someone else wants to weigh in, I need to think about that because that's 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 because we're in a moment right now with yeah. Kamala Harris where this is all uh, it's a very um, you know it's a it's a tricky question. Barrington, I think it's got some, hey, some thoughts. Go on, Barrington, go for it. I would say that I'll give you an example. David Cameron went to Jamaica some years ago and was pressed really hard by then Prime Minister Porter Simpson about reparations from Britain for the enslavement of Africans for the, for the prior 300 years. And he basically told her to get over it. And my understanding in talking to folks about an apology, like Kenneth said, if you, if you make a, an apology by the state, then almost immediately behind that is gonna be reparations or some type of compensation. And they don't want that. In the, and in, in the US, it's complicated. There's a deep racial animus by a good segment of this country. It's active hatred, and then there's people who are just complicit, who they, they, they got their perks, their power, and their privilege, and they're not trying to be uncomfortable, not trying to come to terms and, and face what they're dealing with. And so they just kind of go along. Um, there was a great deal of debate about reparations after ta Coast did a piece in the Atlantic maybe three years ago or something. And they were talking about 14 to $16 trillion that's owed to American descent, to African-Americans. They're not trying to have that conversation. And the thing, the thing that we need to remember, the question that you asked about if it was too much with Obama, Obama is not a progressive. Obama is not someone who embraces liberation theology He's not someone who has embraced in the diaspora and in the US have been um, employing to seek liberation, economic parity and equality. He is a centrist and he is someone who has always defended the status quo. And I think a lot of people put too much on him. We have to always remember that we're dealing with a system of racial and structural, racial racism, structural racism, institutional racism, so one individual isn't going to change that. So, Alicia, I'll, see, I'll do I'll, jump in there. Sorry, Kenneth. I, I, I'll get Alicia and I'll come back to you. El um, sorry, did you want to ask me a question? So I was so engaged in what Barrington was saying. Yes. Um, so obviously he was talking about the reparations and David Cameron yeah. just telling Jamaica to just get over it with regards to. Yeah. I, I guess the wider question was about apologies. Yeah. Now, what, I, I, what do they mean? I'm I'm not surprised um, that David Cameron said that because if you look at what happened last year, um, it was going. A lot of people didn't realise that, and I'm not sure how much Kenneth and Barrington are aware, but um, the families of slave owners in the UK were still getting paid um, reparations, basically for losing the slaves up until I think it was 2015, mm. and most of us did not know that. A lot of people didn't know that, and so you know, the government, I think, don't want to be accountable. I completely agree. Like you said, as soon as they admit to something, they are then liable and it opens the Pandora's box basically for lawsuits and people trying to sue and claim compensation. And um, actually Piers Morgan, no matter what you think of him, but he said uh, yesterday, um, I think he was speaking to Priti Patel and who uh, she, he was saying, you know, why do politicians have a problem with just admitting they're wrong and saying they're sorry? And it is an inherent problem with politicians. They do, they will never confess to anything or admit that they're wrong because again, it just opens up Pandora's box. So I think with them, it's just a case of deny, deny, deny until, until the bitter end. <laughs> Latoya? I would certainly echo what has been said. Um, I think there will be that reluctance to agree that they were at fault and there was an issue in the first place and to be held accountable. 
um, perhaps out of fear of a backlash, perhaps out of fear of um, various legal ramifications as well and reputational issues too. Um, we are seeing still here in the UK um, following the Windrush um, movement that various people are still not receiving compensation or indeed the full amount that was due to them. And they still had that reluctance on the government um, to admit that they were at fault and there was an error and there were various investigations undertaken as a result of that by the families and their relatives impacted by all of this. So I think there is a great degree of reticence um, to admit that there was that issue in the first instance um, in order to ensure that there wouldn't be subsequent um, floodgates opened, um, which would then be beyond their control. Kenneth, I think you wanted to jump in earlier. Did you did you have a particular view based on what Barrington said, or now that you've heard everyone? Yeah, now that I've been able to kind of <laughs> get um, get everyone's opinion and and uh, adapt mine to it. No, I think I think the reason that it's a tricky question is because um, you know this we're talking about a system that is bigger than any one individual or even any one generation. Um, you know, the, there's economic interest behind just saying, let's move on, like just get over it because there, um, the United States government and really the enterprise of America is not going to um, relinquish that uh, the power that has been established by the way it was founded um, through through enslavement and the oppression of, of black people and through white supremacy, there's a, a you know there's a big economic incentive to ignore and to deny that justice. Um, but I think and I'm and uh, the thing about the thing about you know the the individual ascension of certain um, people of color to positions of power. Is that there? I, I do think that there is an opportunity sometimes to create a political pressure um, from the collective on that individual that you know that there you know that make it so that it, there must be some progress made. I don't think that there's any one individual, whether it is Barack Obama or Kamala Harris. Um, who, you know, just by the, their own individual experience and their own individual identity are going to be able to issue an apology on behalf of a state. But I do think that um, we shouldn't totally ignore the opportunities there um, for the people to make it politically impossible uh, for the discussion to be ignored about justice and reparations. One thing that fascinated me watching the documentary um, was obviously following the assassination of Dr. King and just how brutal that was, given his kind of non-violent rhetoric was, and I'll start with Latoya on this one. Why, why did that assassination, why did he not inspire a leader like a king or someone more progressive, to use the term that um, Barrington used earlier, why didn't it stimulate that kind of a leader where we've now ended up with an Obama, which according to Barrington, is not the kind of leader that's going to generate that liberation and progress, as Kenneth um, pointed out there, Latoya. Why do you think America hasn't stimulated that environment for a different type of leader that will spiritualize and mobilize black people in America? I suppose that they're always trying to ensure that there is that balance. So whilst they want to be viewed as progressive in terms of ensuring that there are equal and fair rights and just treatment for the black communities that by the same token, they're not going to be so controversial to 
alienate um, a lot of the voting public as well. So I suppose whilst they may have somebody that is going to try to advance some of the rights, they don't necessarily want to um, be seen to be so problematic um, that they then are not able to ensure that some of the rights that they're advocating are going to be adopted. Um, so if they were so adversarial and really trying to promote everything in terms of the black communities and perhaps none of their um, efforts would be agreed with by various others. So I think they're probably trying to strive for that balance so that at least some measures are amended and adopted um, in favour of the black communities. Kenneth, your response to that? Yeah, well, I think that the reason, um, well, I think that the reason that, that it has been seen, you know, this figure that, uh, you know, would, would fill the void of, of Dr. Dr. King, as you put it, um, is because there has been, you know, a strategic effort by the most funded, most powerful um, agencies on the planet to prevent the public from seeing those figures. Um, you know, there was it was never just Dr. King, um, but I think Dr. King was did um, make himself into an extraordinary leader. Um, I think you know through the the sixties um, and definitely through the seventies, there was a series of uh, there was a series of um, strategies to you know to totally disorganize and destroy um, you know, black movements for social justice in the United States. Uh, you know, we talk about the Panthers, Fred Hampton, um, the, there's so much leadership and potential that was uh, wiped out and, and illegally, even according to the standards of the state. Um, and so, I think, you know, there was a number of other factors that happened, you know, through the 80s, um, both economically and, you know, in terms of the, the, the um, proliferation of, of drugs into black community. Um, but I think also there has been uh, a different emphasis in the organizing strategies uh, of modern times. I think with Black Lives Matter, um, it's been understood that, you know, that, that focus on individual leadership has provoked, you know, this kind of, uh, you know, extraordinary targeting by the state. Um, and so there's been a de-emphasis on individual leaders, um, which was, I mean, always, it was always in development, even in the 60s, you know, Ella Baker, you know, has a quote that a lot of people in the United States, uh, a lot of people in the U.S., uh, particularly uh, who are politically active no which is you, you want to make strong people so that they don't need strong leaders but what you know that can also mean is that there can be many more strong leaders um, so that if one person is targeted um, not only can they you know can the movement not stop just because they've been targeted but also we can we're in a better position to understand how that targeting works and how people can be protected and how trust can be preserved. Um, so that the movement um, for, you know, this the community that we want to see can continue and can can be made uh, real. Alicia, what do you think about the, the, the void that hasn't been filled per se post Dr. King? Um, yeah, just to sort of spring off what Kenneth was saying, I agree as well that um, like with Black Lives Matter and Latoya, Latoya was saying as well, um, people don't want to be targeted. You, a lot of people don't probably don't want to be that one person who the FBI or the police are targeting. And I think also we're in a different time where our way of life is different. And the, at the moment there is so much noise, we've got social media, so it's probably harder than it was back then for one voice to stand out. And so with organizations like Black Lives Matter, it probably has 
well, it does have a bigger impact with a million voices rather than just that one voice because there is so much that we have to tune out. Um, and yeah, I think people, they probably just don't wanna be targeted. Um, and with things like social media, I think it makes it easier to target one person in terms of like the FBI and the police and that kind of thing. So are you saying ultimately that leadership doesn't matter in that there's a figurehead doesn't really command that power and potency as opposed to um, strength in numbers, basically what you're saying. Yeah, I, I wouldn't say that as a blanket statement, but um, probably for the most part, yeah, I think strength in numbers is probably uh, something that's more important these days. Barrington? Yeah, I'm thinking that if you see an apostle of peace get his head blown off for ad advocating for justice and equality for African Americans, there are not going to be a whole bunch of people running up to try to become the leader. And I think one of the smartest things that um, Black Lives Matter and a number of social justice organizations have done lately is that they have decentralized leadership, which makes it much more difficult for the FBI and these other government um, agencies to target one person. But they are still using the same types of um, tactics because they've, they've, they have cops who infiltrated Black Lives Matter chapters in different cities. They are wiretapping, they, in fact, and then you have this, this, this added problem of the occupant constantly disparaging Black organizations, Black Lives Matter, Black people. And so the tail end of last year, a number of the original Black Lives Matter, like um, Alicia Gaza and, and Patrice Collis Khan, they had to go into hiding because they had white, white domestic terrorists who said, Trump said to go kill them and they were, they, were, they were targeting them. And so they had to get extra security and that type of thing. So we're, we're in a really weird place because we find that the FBI and the laws that are supposed to govern the way that we're treated aren't really for us, it's for other people. And I mean, if you, if you look at the, the documentary, I think Andrew Young was asking, how is it that, that the FBI could have Dr. Martin Luther King under such surveillance and yet somebody, somebody gets in and kills him? So there is a, a conflict of interest when you're dealing with the FBI and, these, and the, the, the US government because they don't see black people as being equal to white Americans. And the, 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 the things that we would assume that are due to us as citizens in this country, often we don't get. And one of the things too is that I'm thinking about all the young people and the not so young people that I've met who head different organizations, who are involved in various aspects of, of the social justice movement. And because they're not on, on TV or not in the media, doesn't mean they're not doing the work. There are lots of folks who are doing the work and we see, the, we, we, we see the results of that every day. And for me, it's like the best thing to do is to avoid publicity and just do the work that needs to be done. So, Sure. So, so what, what do we say about um, the various African-American athletes who have been very activist in the area of Trump? So obviously I'm referring to people like Colin Kaepernick, Nomi Osaka, LeBron James. Um, what, do we, what do we make of their activism, almost like using their soft power to kind of get that important message across about equality and injustice and oppression? Is, is that a worthwhile use of their influence? Because obviously it's we're very, talking about leadership here. It, it's very important. It's a type of leadership. Yeah, it's very important because um, if Barrington Salmon gets up in a, in a social setting and says anything, it's going to be like, who the hell is this dude? But if LeBron 
or Nomi, Naomi uh, Osaka, if they, they get up, they have a they have a ready. Mean LeBron is amazing because he's shown the the importance of melding his athleticism and his athletic life with social justice work. He started a, a charter school that they said he was heavily involved in getting mobilizing and organizing people to vote during this election. And he's he's picked different areas to get involved in, and that's important. Kaepernick, Kaepernick has paid, well, not the ultimate price, but he's paid a heavy price for his activism because they, they basically locked him down in the prime of his, of his career and no, no team in the National Football League would hire him. So he's paid, a, he's paid a heavy price for that, but he doesn't seem to be worried because he's more committed to... Kenneth? What do we think about athletes and their activism replacing your kind of typical leadership? Well, I think that, you know, we, we don't, um, what we need is, is an expansion on the typical leadership that we've had. And so I think it is, you know, it is important that everyone who has the ability to raise consciousness does that. Every, anyone who has a platform, um, and is able to, you know, influence people. There is, I think, you know, there is a moral responsibility to, um, to you know, not ignore what's happening in life. Um, I think everyone has to make that decision. I think that it might be, it might be a mistake to, tr to frame our, you know, our athletes and entertainers as our leadership. Um, only because they're not um, entirely uh, accountable to the public um, in the way that you know our, our people deserve, um, and also they're not really in a position to be. Um, they're not really in a position to um, you know pro to pass, to create policy. So I, I do think that it is important, you know, that that uh, consciousness is is raised wherever it can be. Um, but you know, I don't know. I mean, I don't know if um, I, I don't know. I think I have some hesitance, though, but just because of the fact that you know we we can also see the way that that can be uh, commodified um, and commercialized. Uh, and all of the the you know kind of critical um, substance of an entertainer an entertainer's um, you know activism can be totally cashed out. So I think you know we we have to you know understand it for what it is, um, and yeah, that's all I can really say about that. Uh, well, in terms of the UK, I guess the one person that comes to mind, and I'm sure Alicia will be able to fill Kenneth in, is Marcus Rashford, who has single-handedly changed policy. Um, and it's funny that you talked earlier about the free breakfast that the Black Panthers were trying to introduce. Um, Marcus Rashford, as um, we all know, uh, has reintroduced free school meals to kids like him when he was growing up. Um, with his mother and he single-handedly rather than the leader of the opposition has impacted uh, the government policy on that. Alicia perhaps you could fill Kenneth in as to the leadership that Marcus Rashford has shown and the impact that that has had on society um, and on black people as well in terms of what influence they can uh, wield that's the word I was looking for. Yeah um, it's been I mean, so commendable. People are calling for him to be knighted. Um, so he is a footballer for, uh, qu don't quote me on this, is it Man City? <laughs> I'm not a huge football fan. Manchester United. <laughs> uh, yeah, he's a footballer and um, unprecedented. He's still very young. No one expected that he would be the voice of reason in the pandemic. He actually persuaded the government to continue the free school mills during the school holidays um, and when kids were at home. So in the UK, we've had lockdowns um, 
and you know kids are obviously at home disadvantaged families can't afford to feed their children for breakfast lunch dinner every single day so um he when he was growing up he also was a disadvantaged um he had a disadvantaged upbringing he came from a very um from a disadvantaged home so he knew what it was like to be hungry and so it really resonated with him that the government were not going to continue feeding these children when they were learning from home and um yeah he started this campaign a free school meals campaign and there was such outrage the government said no uh, he campaigned it got to parliament and uh they actually rejected his campaign and said no we're not going to continue this, the vouchers um and the public got involved and it started everyone started petitioning and eventually boris johnson the prime minister did a u-turn and said no okay but you know he that's probably the one time that the government admitted they were actually in the wrong and they did a u-turn and brought back the free school meal vouchers and you know in the uk footballers especially have such a bad reputation for intelligence um you know they so their reputation is they can only kick a ball they're not good for anything and this here is a young black footballer one of the top footballers in the in the league and he actually made an inc like a positive change and not to downplay anyone else's efforts in campaigning but he wasn't just wearing a t-shirt or and not to say that that's wrong but you know he actually kept pushing and kept pushing and he saw results and it's amazing and also I just want to highlight as well that Lewis Hamilton is another um, British sportsman who has been using I mean he's the, uh, the only uh, again I might be wrong on the on the stats but I think he's the only um black play black racer in the form in Formula One he is that's yeah so and um yeah he used his platform you know again like Colin Kaepernick he had a lot to lose you know he could have lost sponsorships and endorsement deals and all his place in the Formula One you know he had a lot riding on him and every championship he would come out every race and wear the Black Lives Matter t-shirt um justice for Breonna Taylor he would wear all those t-shirts and support but also use his voice you know he used social media to constantly talk about these causes and it is making and it's making I don't know if it's making a change yet but it is at least starting the conversation and keeping the conversation going so uh, are we all agreed then that it, well, we're kind of quite comfortable with leadership being this flexible, whether it comes from entertainers? I know, Kenneth, you talked about the fact that they're not entirely accountable, but then at the same time, reputation is all um, in life. Because if you don't have a reputation or if you have a certain reputation, it only takes one false misstep for it all to disappear. And obviously with social media, that's kind of times a hundred and you know with the pandemic especially there's been so many missteps that celebrities have made in their activism I think of Kylie Jenner I know she's not black but obviously what she was trying to do with that can of Pepsi we'll not say much about that but that's the I point I was trying to make there about how activism can go wrong but um the point about leadership I guess it's, it's very interesting um that Malcolm X hasn't been mentioned yet or Muhammad Ali or Jesse Jackson or Al Sharpton, uh, or even Shirley Chisholm. I mean, how do we feel about these people in terms of leadership and where they fit into the narrative of Dr. King's legacy? Um, Barrington, I'll start with you on this one. Well, it's interesting because Jesse Jackson, um, I talked to folks that know him real well and people that were, you know, I was only eight years old when Dr. King was assassinated. And they said one of the things he did was he, he nestled Dr. King's head in his in his lap, I guess, and then smeared the blood on his T-shirt and went and did an interview with the idea of giving the, giving the impression that Dr. King's mantle somehow fell to him. Um, there are enough, there's enough examples of the Jacksons. Um, Al Sharpton is a leader. Um, I have talked to people who have criticized them and others that it's based because it's based, they say it's basically a paycheck that a lot of times when they confront state governors and other, pe other, other political leaders, they usually, they say they usually cut a deal for themselves and that type of thing. 
So that 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 knowledge, I guess, and those rumors have have caused a lot of skepticism from people that would that might have might have looked at these guys and put them at the level of a Dr. King. Um, Muhammad Ali, he spent three of his best years as as an athlete. Um, they tried to put him in prison. They 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 took his passport. He couldn't travel. He couldn't work. So he paid a heavy price for that. So you know, for me, who was the president of Burkina Faso from 1983 to 87, um, called the, the Che Guevara of Africa, someone who was a fabulous, fabulous person in terms of of liberation ideas and and infusing that in in the populace the populace of Burkina Faso. And he said that if he dies, it's not a problem because his whole idea is to create 7 million Sankaras. And so if we think of it that way, that each of, because, you know, each, each of us have something to contribute to our growth and development and liberation, if that's what we want, because some people don't want that. Some people want to be comfortable. Some people don't want to be bothered. But for those of us who see liberation, I mean, I'm 63 and pretty much from the time that I was conscious, I've always been thinking about what do I need to do to move us forward? Because the, as far as I'm concerned, the conditions in which we live is untenable. And this, and this is not just something or, or to England. Anywhere you go in the world now, black people are catching hell because they're black. They're, they're perceived as a threat. They are painted as criminals, they're painted as taken from Francis de Sales Elementary School in Tottenham. And I remember the guy who was my geography teacher who told me when I was six years old that black people have never given, never made any contribution of significance in the history of the world, right? And that's what they taught. And what, so when I went to Jamaica as an eight year old, I was expecting to go into a place where, we, where there'd be nothing, of, nothing that approached what I was used to in, in, in England, but it was a lie because I saw the black doctors, black judges, I mean, fabulous people with great minds building a country. So one of the things that we have to do is fight back against the educational system that is a lie, against um, popular ideas and popular narratives of what black people are, because a lot of it is a lie. So one of the, th one of the most important things that you do, you and Claire do, Emmanuel, and what Kenneth is doing, is providing a narrative that provides a true, true reflection of what black, black people are. Black people in all their complexities and in all different ways. And it's so important because if we don't control the narrative, we're gonna be dealing with this forever and ever. So. No, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for that Barrington. Um, your checks in the post, by the way, um, wasn't expecting you to say that. But um, I guess uh, as you were talking, I was thinking of smaller. <laughs> As you were talking, I was thinking of small acts and kind of the legacy that Sir Steve McQueen has left. Yeah? And it's, it started the debate um, with regards to black culture. How important is it? Why should people care? Um, Latoya, as a film critic, when, when you hear figures of 1.2 million um, watching small acts, and then you have 10 million watching I'm a Celebrity, Get Me Out of Here, on another channel, and then you have three million people watching Escape to the Chateau on Channel Four. What does that say about our culture in terms of the appreciation of what people like Sir Steve McQueen is trying to do, especially for the Caribbean communities who have been starved of their culture on screens on a regular basis? I certainly recall when Small Axe came on, um, mentioning to quite a few relatives who are um, from the Caribbean that the programme was actually on and when it was on. And the response from some of them was, um, yes, I would watch it at that time. Various others said they would watch it on catch up. And I think that because we have that availability to watch, various programs um, on demand when we wish. Um, quite a few people took that decision that yes, they would watch The Crown or I'm a Celebrity, Get Me Out of Here and watch um, the various 
episodes of the Small Axe Anthology on catch up. Um, quite a few people weren't quite aware of the content of a lot of the films within the anthology. So for them as well, it perhaps didn't necessarily have the same significance as it might do for those of us that are British born, but have parents from the Caribbean. Um, but equally, again, for a lot of people, it was a case of, well, it's a Sunday night. Um, that's something that I will reserve to watch at another time. Um, I think from conversations that I had with people that aren't necessarily from the um, Black diaspora, that they were surprised that certain events had occurred. Um, they were not aware of it, but also those within the Black diaspora were not aware of it because these were matters that aren't necessarily um, addressed within Black education when you are in schools growing up. And so I think there has been a really good dialogue um, following the films and whilst the films were on as well, in terms of how we are educated within Black British schools in terms of our history, um, not just um, history coming from North America, but also history um, of the interactions and um, the involvement of Black communities um, within Britain as well. So I think those films have actually helped to instigate a much wider um, issue and hopefully there will be some movement and positive change as a result of that. So for you, irrespective of the low viewing figures, how do we measure the impacts of the issues that Sistine raised in those five films? A lot of the conversations that I saw were occurring on um, social media. Um, I do know there were subsequent um, question and answer sessions. There were also panel discussions as well um, for those within the Black communities. So those type of events, I believe, will help to um, introduce that narrative into other um, spaces as well. Um, I know that one of the concerns um, just from a film review um, perspective was that not enough um, Black critics were able to uh, watch films from the Small Axe Anthology um, when the films were actually um, being distributed by way of advanced screenings. Um, so that was something that uh, was an issue. So it just meant even before the films were actually aired on the BBC um, where they were in festivals, um, perhaps there wasn't that awareness um, because the critics that were reviewing them for the most part were not ones for whom there was that same resonance in terms of the themes addressed. Um, so I think that's certainly an area where there could be that improvement to ensure that these stories, um, the black stories, are actually going to be treated in a in a manner that ensures that there is that widespread awareness of them. Um, and that is probably going to be as a result of diversifying the pool um, that have access to them in the first instance. Sure. Before I bring in Alicia, Kenneth, I just wanted to get a sense from you. Did you get a chance to watch Small Axe? So I know it came out um, five days after it was shown in the UK on the BBC on Prime Video. Did you get a chance to watch Small Axe? No, I haven't, I haven't seen Small Axe yet. I've seen a lot of um, trailers and previews for it and I'm looking forward to, to watching it. Um, I think throughout the pandemic, I've been watching a lot of um, uh, kind of episodic uh, television now, like Michaela Cole's uh, I May Destroy You and a lot of, um, a lot of that kind of HBO Max uh, productions. But one of the things that um, Latoya mentioned was just kind of that um, it connected to your question about how do you measure the impact, um, which is really kind of the distinct, uh, the distinction around my role as an impact producer is A, knowing that, you know, the, the, 
the critics who are able to get um, you know reviews out it's not just that they have you know the uh, a relevant experience to the content of the film but it's also who th their audience is you know the, the critics have their own audience and you know a lot of um, a lot of you know the black community in the states is going to listen to or you know they're the the critics who tell them like this was good i like this we may not totally agree but we still that's who we're listening to that's who we go to um so it's really it is an important part of that kind of um of that aspect of the impact strategy but also i think um only there's you know a certain uh segment of the community that's gonna be going back and forth on social media um, for a variety of reasons. You know, there are people that just aren't going to, that that aren't gonna have the fullness of their opinion expressed on social media, probably because, you, you know, it's very difficult to understand anything really clearly through social media. Um, but uh, one of the things that, you know, that is, uh, my role is kind of shifting into is creating uh, virtual forums because of the pandemic is very difficult to meet in person. But we want to bring people together to have conversations about the work, about the film, um, so that the impact can extend beyond just uh, exposure and revenue. Um, I think that, you know, even with, and I really do, I, I'm a, um, I'm a millennial, you know, I am, pretty much a digital native. So I do understand the importance of social media, but I still respect the fact that it's through personal um, connections, through community conversations, through word of mouth that we really develop understanding. So that's not something that social media will really be able to replace um, us having conversations with ourselves about what we think and going back and forth, um, you know, that is really important. And I don't think that we should only look to uh, social media metrics um, to determine whether or not our work and the narratives that we're telling ourselves are having an impact. I think that we have to always remember that, you know, it's about the work and then it's also about the, um, the conversations that we're having with one another in real life about not just the work and the narrative, but about what does it mean going forward? Sure. And since the release of MLK FBI, obviously you talked about its launch in Toronto and now it's been released on Vogue. Um, have you had a sense as to what black critics have thought about the film compared to white critics? If you've got a sense as to um, a consensus or a difference of opinion or a particular bias? What kind of appreciation have you been getting? Yeah, well, I think um, if I were to make a generalization, I think for a lot of white critics, it has been a lot of like, we, we didn't know this or we weren't you know, fully aware of this. Um, it's shocking, um, I think is probably a, a word that's been used many times. And it's a must must see. I think for um, black critics, I think that it's a it's not as shocking, but it is moving to um, kind of reckon with the fact that you know the the this this is a reality. This is a reality of what happened to Dr. King and the injustice of it. I think is difficult to um, to 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 know um and you know and i think that it kind of re uh reopens some some wounds you know that you know even my generation that wasn't alive when dr king was assassinated um there's still kind of that memory of the fact that um dr king and by extension many many in the movement mega evers um so so many names of people that um, they didn't just give their life, their lives were stolen and they were very beautiful, complex lives. Um, so I think that that is something that uh, uh, many of the, the black critics have picked up on and, and have recognized that that is something um, worth acknowledging 
because it isn't just, you know, it's not just a, a, um, yeah, I mean, this is not just a film. It's not just about a film. It's about uh, a real experience that is about both the individual uh, Martin Luther King Jr., but also about a movement. Alicia, um, working as you do at Metro Newspaper, how, how would that particular audience comprehend the film if you were to review it? Um, I think it, there is an audience for it. We, um, a lot of my job, so I'm an entertainment journalist, like in general, but I cover music, movies, TV, um, celebrity, and I've actually recently just started my own column highlighting Black Lives Matter issues within uh, entertainment. So um, there is definitely an audience for something like MLK FBI, and obviously I'll, I will be writing about it as well. Um, but yeah, I think there is an audience, but there's a particular way to sell it as well. So it might not necessarily be a straight up review that would attract our readers. However, if we highlight something specifically that's shocking within the documentary and put that in the headline, then I think it would appeal to the wider audience. So I think when you're not writing for a black publication, there's a way that you need to sell certain things for it to appeal to a white audience if, or a non-black audience, if that makes sense. How long have you been a journalist and how long has it taken you to cultivate that skill that you kind of allude to in terms of how to put certain things across? Um, so I have been, well, I studied journalism at uni, um, graduated in 2010, and straight from there, I began uh, interning, freelancing for black publications. Um, and then got, so basically I've been doing it for 10 years. <laughs> uh, got my first job uh, about a year after I graduated. Um, which was for a black publication, but actually we wrote mainly about um, black uh, African-American celebrities. Um, so we had, our readership was like 3 million a month and it was US readers, which was quite interesting, even though we were UK based. And then from there I went to another publication and then I ended up at Metro um, two and a half years ago. And um, yeah, so through all of that, I've obviously worked for black publications and now work for an, a national newspaper. And so I think through that, I've learned how to sort of, you sort of know how to sort of like uh, mold your articles basically. And it depends on what I'm writing about as well. If I'm writing about a Kim Kardashian, I'll know that it's for a black and white audience. If it's about Kate Winslet, I know probably black readers aren't really gonna read about her, but you just sort of learn on the job, I guess, you just sort of know how to tailor your writing. And just going back on what Latoya was talking about with Small Axe and Steve McQueen, um, talk to me about kind of the appreciation of his work and why that wasn't reflected in the viewing figures and ultimately whether that matters when you've got things like Bridgerton on Netflix, which has a different kind of measurement and appreciation of black talent and black characters in a world that is not particularly black. Yeah, so I, I actually covered small acts. Um, so I went, I sat in with a couple of the Q and A sessions they had, uh, and wrote stories from that. Um, wrote up the interviews that they did, um, and covered a couple of the episodes as well. Um, I didn't get a chance to do uh, the last three, but I did Mangrove, and um, uh, not. Some What's the uh, Lovers Love Rock? Rock? Lovers Rock. Um, so I covered those two, and they did the stories did well in terms of traffic on the website. Um, and I think those were the two most popular ones, I believe, out of the whole series in the UK. Um, so yeah, in terms of Metro, they those the parts that the episodes that we did cover, they those did do well. Um, in terms of viewing figures and why it only got like a million, I think. The, the network that it aired was probably the biggest problem. Um, the BBC is amazing. It, it, they're known for producing top tier dramas, but I think the way that black people consume shows is binge watching on Netflix and Amazon Prime. And so when you're waiting every week 
five weeks for one episode and the films were an hour and a half on average, maybe an hour as well. It's a long time to wait. And I think we just don't consume our dramas like that. However, I think for a white audience, they will, it's more traditional for them, I guess, to sit around and watch The Bodyguard every like week on week. I don't really know why that is. And I don't want to generalize for all black people, obviously, but it obviously shows in the numbers. I think we all watched, well, I don't know if you've seen Bridgerton, but 63 million people apparently have watched Bridgerton in the space of a month. And it's, I think a big part is because it was on Netflix. Had it been on the BBC or ITV, I don't think it would have attracted such a big audience. And um, I think a part of that is because of the race as well. The way that race is um, shown and depicted in that series um, has attracted a black audience. But again, it's accessible because it's on Netflix. If Small Lax goes on Netflix tomorrow and it's on everyone's homepage or people are like, oh, have you seen this Small Lax on Netflix? It will go far, but I don't know. I, I don't know how many people go on BBC iPlayer and scout for shows, you know? So but I think it, it was on Prime Video. So are we saying that Prime Video doesn't have that cut through in terms of drama or? I think, but I'm not, not is, was it free in the UK for Prime Video? I think it was actually charging. I could be wrong, but I'm, I know in America, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I think in America it's free on Prime Video and over here you, it's charging because it's free on BBC iPlayer. So yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, we've got about 10 minutes left, so there's so many questions that I want to ask, but um, Kenneth, just talk to me about your role as an impact producer. For those that are not familiar with that term, what is it in general, and for the purposes of MLK FBI, what was your brief? Yeah, so the, the role of the impact producer is kind of a um, relatively newer role. Um, it kind of takes a lot of the same uh, duties and responsibilities of a traditional producer, um, but then kind of it, it swaps a few of them out for a heavier presence in distribution and exhibition and extending, like I said before, um, really extending the goals of the, the film beyond just the, the getting exposure and making sure that the film has high revenue. Um, it really is about making sure that the message of the film um, is discussed and, and that the film has an opportunity to kind of uh, be developed in a public discourse. Um, and so basically what I've been able to do is uh, work with a, a number of different institutions and organizations um, and we, are planning for there to be virtual forums uh, where we're going to be having discussions very similar to you know the discussions that we're having right now um, but also trying to bring in um, some you know currently elected uh, politicians um, and and really trying to see like what kinds of substantive discussions can we have about the issues and questions that are raised in this film um, and you know my for me, as the impact producer, the ultimate hope is that you know some of these discussion discussions can turn into um, concrete results. You know what happened to Dr. King, what happened to uh, the Panthers, what happened to a whole host of organizations, um, and you know really just people um, trying to organize themselves to have power in their society. Um, it wasn't just from the federal government. There was a role that local governments played. Um, and so we have to recognize that, you know, the way that power works, uh, we can have an influence on it. So if we become conscious of the way that power works through these discussions, then the next step is, okay, well, who, who's holding that power right now? And what is their position on surveillance? What is their position um, on the ability to single out activists or organizers as identity extremists? Um, and what are they doing to protect the right of particularly black people to dissent in this country? 
So, you know, we can, we can view a film and I think filmmakers, you know, um, we make work and we're used to kind of letting it go once it has been distributed and it belongs to the world. The world can make of it what they want. The world may ignore it for, you know, a time being. And then once you, you know, have passed away, the world may say, look at this great work. You know, you, you really never know. But the role of an impact producer is really to try to um, instigate the conversation while the film um, is fresh and really trying to, to, uh, to instigate a change if it's possible. And, and you know, that, that role, it changes with different projects, with different films, you know, an impact producer um, for a different kind of documentary or even a different kind of uh, scripted film you know, it, it, it may change. When we were making this film, you know, the film was being edited through the summer of last year, through uh, April, May, June. You know, we were literally watching, I mean, I was getting different, you know, edits through June, but that all of that, you know, of, of what we were seeing through television and social media was influencing, okay, what, what, moment are we in? What kind of impact can a film like this have now? Um, you know, and I think the role of an impact producer is to really try to recognize that moment and to identify others who recognize that moment so that we can come together um, and really amplify uh, the, the kinds of, uh, of conversations and ultimately change that can happen. Barrington, why should people watch MLK FBI, the documentary? <sighs> Keep it they brief. Should, they, should, they should watch it because past his prologue. What happened, what happened in 1965, 63, 68 is what's going on now. And, you know, for me, as I'm listening to Kenneth, I'm just kind of thinking to myself that the almost full year of social justice protests in this country has opened up another extraordinary moment that we can really begin to advocate and pressure for change and have substantive change. Because what usually happens is that you have protests, some people might burn some things down, and when things are quiet, the ones who are being pressed to, to it, try to, to effect change just kind of pull, pull back and figure if they don't say anything, if they keep real quiet, the people who are advocating for change will go away. So it's important. It's important because of its possibilities, I guess. And I would just say one thing. I watched the documentary this morning at five o'clock and I was filled with rage and deep anger at how this person and this agency and this government thought it was okay to violate the privacy in the ways that they did with Dr. King and his family. And it, there's an, a certain irony because when, when you think about the stories that you hear about J. Edgar Hoover, his sexual indiscretions and his sexual peculiarities were much more egregious in my mind than Dr. King sleeping with some women. Because as far as I'm concerned, Dr. King sleeping with some women is an issue he and his wife have to deal with. And for them to say, kill yourself, or we're gonna expose you. I don't think Dr. King would have survived in 2020 or 2021, not with social media the way it is. So I think the fact that, he, that this happened in the 60s insulated him, and it says something to me that they sent these tapes and these letters to all these different media people and nobody ran it. That says a lot to me in terms of people's integrity. And this is the, and most of these were white people. So that, that, that says a lot. Latoya, why, why should people watch this documentary? People should watch the documentary as it is an extremely compelling portrayal of the level of harassment that Dr. King endured um, during a time when there were peaceful protests and 
it just highlights that there was that non-discriminatory targeting of black people irrespective of um, their actions. So I think essentially, as the phrase says, um, in order to move forward, we need to know our past. And so um, the documentary helps to highlight a lot of the treatment that um, black people were subjected to and are still subjected to now. So it remains extremely relevant now. Alicia, why, why should people watch this documentary? Um, people should watch this amazing documentary because I think a lot of times we hear, we hear of the treatment of black people, whether it's from the police or their white neighbor, and we might see the videos on social media. But when it comes to the police and uh, the FBI and authorities like that, a lot of the times it's brushed under the carpet and we don't actually see the evidence of how they've harassed these people. Um, and so I think people should watch that, get an understanding of what MLK was subjected to, and then also realize at the end of it that the FBI have still haven't taken accountability for any of this and let that sink in. And it's actually quite a scary thing to think about, but it's the reality for black, uh, for African-Americans. So I think, yeah, watch it and get a good education. For those that have yet to watch MLK FBI, it is out now on all VOD platforms, including Apple TV, which is where you can watch 60 official British Urban Film Festival selections as well. Alicia Barrington, Kenneth Latoya, thanks for your time today. Thanks for joining me. Thank you, Emmanuel. Thank you. Thanks, Emmanuel. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Thank you all. Take care. Right. Nice to see you, everyone. Okay. Yes. It's good to be on the panel with you. Thank you. Bye for now. Thanks so much. Bye bye. Violence is self defeating. He who lives by the sword will perish by the sword. You know, when you construct a man as a great man, there's nothing almost more satisfying than also seeing him as the opposite. When the National Archive puts government documents up on the web, one has to confront them. Tapes from the hotel rooms, FBI reports, those are pieces of information that we shouldn't have. The FBI was most alarmed about King because of his success. He realized how sick this country was. We were trying to reveal the truth about segregation. J. Edgar Hoover is famous for saying that he feared the rise of a black messiah. The FBI says it's clear Martin Luther King Jr. is the most dangerous Negro in America, and we have to use every resource at our disposal to destroy him. J. Edgar Hoover was the head of the FBI for 48 years. The FBI's focus was collecting salacious sexual material of King with various girlfriends. Hoover had made the speech that Martin Luther King was the world's most notorious liar. Now, what am I going to do about Martin Luther King? It looks to me like he's too far north. This was a way that they could bring down a very influential black civil rights leader and contain the movement. The FBI mailed a tape of Dr. King with other women to him and to Coretta with an advice that he should go kill himself. The greatness of America is the right to protest far right. Staying calm under fire is very hard when people are trying to kill you. Anybody who was to the left of mainstream in civil rights was deemed a subversive. They use surveillance in order to foment violence and break apart these organizations. They were running a surveillance state. This represents the darkest part of the Bureau's history. Festival for Diversity in the World. This is Buzz.